fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Okay, you are back in the House of Mystery and we are at the interview part of the uh, um, of the show. And uh, today we have a real treat for you. It's been a great week and uh, today we're going to be talking about a new book called a tangled web and the uh, author is with us and that's leslie rule thank you for being here leslie thanks for having me wow so now you've got a famous name we should uh, clear that out of the way I so, do. <laughs> so you happen to be um the daughter of Anne rule yes Anne was my mom and i learned a lot about crime from her she actually started taking me to trials with her when I was 17 to take photographs of the killers. Wow. Um, does that put kind of a, a pressure on you to perform when you write a true crime book? Um, I don't think I felt pressure just because I've written a number of other books and other genres. So I'm confident as an author. Um, but I knew when I decided to write a true crime book, that people were going to compare and that some people were going to pick on me, you know, like they do. There's always there's always trolls online. But so far, um, it's been mostly positive feedback. But um, no, I didn't. I didn't can't say that I felt pressured. OK. And and, um, and and you did say you you wrote some other books and I've noticed that now it seems like you've focused a lot of your books previous um, to kind of the paranormal side yes. of, the, of the world. How did, how, how did that come about? Well, I grew up in a haunted house in Des Moines, Washington, and that's where my fascination with ghostly things started. I always found it very interesting. It was scary when I was a kid, but when I was an adult, it I found it reassuring, and I still do. Because when you can find evidence of life after death, it means there's more. And it's not over when it's over, when we think it's over. So um, I actually don't think ghosts are very scary. I just find the, the idea very fascinating. What kind of things did you experience as a kid to uh, in this haunted house? Well, the house was built on a Native American burial ground. And so that, kinda, that made it kind of creepy from the start because... Um, Sometimes there were, when they were doing excavation on roads nearby, they would actually find skeletons. Uh, but the the ghost at, that I heard at our house was actually heard all over the neighborhood. And she cried. And it was the most pitiful, heartbreaking sob that you can ever imagine. And I I heard her just once, but other neighbors heard her frequently. And I was in my basement bedroom, um, and I I thought it was my sister. I had a teenage sister, a little bit older than me, and I thought, oh, some boy's broken her heart. So I jumped up and ran out of the room, went all through the house, and the crying always seemed to be one room away, no matter where I went. And finally, uh, I got all through the house, and it faded away. And I found my mom in the kitchen making dinner, dry-eyed. No one else was home. My brothers were out playing. My sister wasn't home. And as it turned out, she was heard most often in a house where I babysat just up the street. And that family would hear a faint sobbing um, as it started to get dark at night. And the darker it got, the louder the crime became until it sounded like it was in their cellar, with the, um, accompanied by the sounds of, Jars rolling and bones crunching. Oh, jeez! <laughs> did you, did this um, kind of change your um, 
outlook on on ghosts and and all that was that sort of that experience and maybe some of the others does that kind of what directs you now well see i grew up in a household where my parents believed in ghosts and they just accepted it as as it was just a normal thing and they would talk about how my father's grandfather haunted the house and that he he was a benign ghost um but there was there was other stuff going on that I think creeped everybody out. But my mom had a fascination with the paranormal also and a very strong sixth sense. So I grew up thinking that I never thought it was weird or that it was something that, that the idea that somebody wouldn't believe in ghosts was actually bizarre to me just because it was such a common thing where, where I grew up. Hmm. Wow. So now, now this is your first true crime book, I, I believe, right? Um, well, yes. My, some of a couple of my ghost books featured uh, some cases that involved true crime, and I did help my mom quite a bit toward the end of her life uh, with her last book. But this is the the first book with my byline, um, a full length uh, true crime book. Uh, now, so. What possessed you <laughs> uh, to write this book? Well, I, I kept hearing from my mom's readers who would ask me to write a true crime book. And they really missed her, and they were readers of my ghost books, and they thought that I could do it. And so I thought about it for a long time. And then I decided that... I could do some good with it. And the thing that made my mom the most proud was the fact that her book saved lives. And she would get letters from readers saying that they recognized danger when they saw it coming because of her books. So I decided to just carry on the legacy and warn the public about something that everyone's aware of but we forget. And that's that female killers are out there. And that the female can be just as dangerous, if not more so, than the male killers. Why do you think that is? Like, what what is it about a female that uh, makes her more dangerous of a killer than a male? I think it's because we don't expect it. And so they can cover up their crimes easier. Um, No one is expecting to be harmed by a female, or few people are. And people are off guard. You know, one thing I'll say, too, um, the, the females that have been um, caught, like Jody Arias and, and convicted, they very seldom ever get put to death either. Yes, um, jurors have a very hard time stomaching, stomaching the idea of females being executed. It's not fair, uh, but it's the way it is. It, that goes along with our whole uh, perspective on what a female is. We see them as gentle creatures, and they're usually mothers, and they're softer, and um, they can get away with a lot more because of it. Hmm. Now, um, how did you pick this story, this this story, and how did you find uh, uh, the the Kara Lee Farber story? I was looking for a case, first of all, with a female killer. And I was um, also looking for something with a bit of a twist. And this one was interesting because the killer used electronics to both commit and conceal her crimes. And this is a whole new kind of danger that a lot of us are not aware of. There's so many things that can be done uh, with apps that, that people just have no idea about. And those can be used as a ruses. For instance, uh, somebody can get an app to change their voice on the phone. Um, A female can sound like a male, and a male can sound like a female. And I believe that's something that this killer did at one point when she called the victim's mother. She had a voice app and pretended to be uh, the ex-boyfriend of of the victim. So that's um, yeah, that's pretty scary too. I guess, and and you can make it look like you're calling from a different number, and yes, and there, there's all sorts of things. Um, now, 
maybe maybe let's talk a little bit about this story. So, what what year was it, and and how did it start? Well, it was in Omaha, Nebraska, and a nice guy. His name's uh, Dave Krupa. Had just broken up with his uh, longtime girlfriend, Amy Flora. They'd had a couple kids together, and the relationship didn't work out. And so they parted ways. They were still parenting together, but she was living across the water in Council Bluffs, Iowa, and he was living in Omaha. And he was lonely, so he got online and decided to try online dating. And he met. Uh, a woman by the name of Liz. It was the very first person he met, and she was attractive, and she seemed like a nice lady. So they met for coffee, and he was kind of intimidated by her because she was attractive, and he hadn't dated for a very long time, and so he he wasn't even quite sure how to behave. It, he'd been a you know in his early twenties the last time that he'd been on a date. So after a few dates. Um, he finally made a move and kissed her, and, and it turned into a fiery uh, love affair. Um, but he got bored with it extremely quickly. And he had told her from the beginning that he did not want to be in a committed relationship, that he wanted to be able to date multiple women, and she seemed to be fine with that. But really, she wasn't. Um, she was playing along. Hmm. So, so where where did the problem um, happen then? Like, what 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 was the problem? Just him she, not being interested. She became very possessive, and she didn't want him to date other females. And um, but he he was restless, and he knew that she wasn't somebody he wanted to be with for a long time. He liked her okay, you know. They had a little bit of fun together, and she was attractive, but it just was not a deep connection. Uh, but she wouldn't let go. So he met um, Carrie Farver, um, a brilliant woman about his age, a mother. Um, she was single. She there was an instant spark. Uh, she'd come into the um, into the shop uh, for a car repair, and they both felt something right away. And so they ended up getting together and dating, and it seemed to be working out really well. Um, but his ex, Liz, would not let go. This is Shanna Elizabeth Golier um, is her name, and sometimes I'll refer to her as Shanna and sometimes as Liz because that's what she did. She called herself Liz with some people and Shanna with others. Hmm. That's kind of a, uh, unusual. Was it? Um, she, did she have kind of two personalities and she sort of presented one personality I, with each name? You know, that's an interesting idea. Um, she Maybe. may have changed it up a little bit, but I don't have any evidence that that's what she did. Right, right. She might have thought, well, I'm Liz, and she might have been uh, more aggressive and more like a certain style to her that she wasn't when she was Shanna. She very well could have, but I, I wasn't able to actually compare it and see it side by side. Hmm. Um, but that's a, that's a really interesting idea. So uh, so now then, so what what happened then? I guess what, Kara Lee went missing. Is that what happened? Um, yes. Carrie was staying with Date for about two weeks because she, she was a computer coder, and there was a big project at her job um, that needed to be completed quickly. And he lived half a mile from the place where she worked. She lived 40 minutes away, and... It was a really long drive back and forth, especially if she was working late. So he invited her to stay. And so she had her her uh, mother and a stepfather look after her son, who was 15 at the time. And she was focusing on, on getting this project done um, while she was staying with Dave. And so um, they, Dave and Carrie seemed to be see things eye to eye. They both said... They did not want to be tied down. They just wanted to have some fun. And they were just enjoying each other's company. So everything seemed fine. And one morning he left for work. And he remembers seeing her. She was on the couch. And she was in her pajamas. And she was working on her computer. And she was doing some coding. And he said, see you later at the end of the day. And 
they were both seemed to be looking forward to it. So he went to work, and mid morning, he got a text, and it was from Carrie's number, and it said, "Why don't we move in together?" And he was stunned when he saw that because that was so totally different from what um, they'd both been talking about. So he texted back, "No, that's not going to happen." And he received a really rude text in reply saying she never wanted to see him again, that she was seeing someone else. And he was shocked, but he accepted it at face value. And he got home at the end of the day. He went in. There was no sign she'd ever been there. She hadn't left anything behind. And he was he was hurt, but he figured, well, you know, I only knew her for a couple weeks, so maybe there was this other side to her that I didn't see. And he just figured that was it. But then he continued to get emails and texts from someone claiming to be Carrie. And suddenly he was being stopped. And not only that, Liz uh, was complaining that she was being stopped too. And she told them someone had broken into her garage and vandalized it. They, she'd painted a, um, something on the wall that said whore from Dave, stolen some um, old checks of hers. And you know, Liz told them, she, you know, she was terrified. And um, both Dave and Liz were extremely, Liz seemed to be extremely upset. And Dave was very, very upset. So they kind of came back together so that they could talk about it. And um, the, Dave thought she's the only one that really understands what I'm going through. And he felt terrible, too, because Liz said she blamed him. He said, why couldn't you have just been happy with me? Why did you have to go out and find a nut? You know, now, now look at the mess we're in. So the, the guilt actually drove him back into her arms. Wow. And he never had any, any, um, any indication at all. He had no, no thoughts that there was something wrong. No, and this is where we were talking earlier about the electronic tricks. Because I asked him, I said, what was it that convinced you um, that Carrie was the one doing this? And he said that um, there was an app called Letter Me Later, where somebody can send emails and texts at, at a certain time to arrive at a specific time. And he would often be with Liz and they'd be sitting there watching TV together and they would both get a message at the same time and they'd go to their phones and it would be the stalkers sending each of them a, a, a message and it never occurred to him that Liz could be doing it because she was sitting there with her phone nowhere near her uh, when he got these messages and when she was getting these messages too. And yep. the thing is, is like I think that when we have um, the way our brains work, we have a tendency to hold on to the first impression we make, uh, if, if, or the first impression we have. So if his first impression was that Carrie was stalking him, and then things happened to support that idea, it was harder for him to see what was really happening. Now, did did he ever um, decide that he was going to go uh, face her, you know, like go to her house and say, hey, you know, or go find her and, and tell her to stop or, or, or phone her or, you know, do you know what I mean? Like, was he ever? Yeah, well, he didn't, um, he tried to, he tried to like connect with her when he'd get these weird texts and he would try to get her to he'd ask what's going on but he would just get these um these very weird threatening texts back and he did not go to her house um i think he just was hoping she'd go away but but they both talked to the police about what was going on and so he was gonna just let the police handle it Wow. And so, so what did the, did the police actually talk to her or look for her? I guess, of course, she's not around. Well, here, this is where it got complicated for law enforcement. Um, Carrie lived in Macedonia, Iowa. Um, she disappeared from Omaha, Nebraska. And both Dave and Liv, Liz lived in Omaha. 
So Dave and Liz were reporting a stalker in to Omaha police. Meanwhile, Carrie's mother is panicking because her daughter seems to have changed a lot. She's getting these bizarre texts um, from her daughter's number. Her daughter's refusing to talk to her. Um, and her Nancy, Nancy Rainey, Carrie's mother, knew something was wrong. She doubted that the person texting her was Carrie, and she tried to get... Um, She'd say, this isn't talking. She'd text, I need to talk to you. You need to call me. And there were no calls. So Nancy knew right away, like within a couple days, something was wrong. Because it, it was such out-of-character behavior for Carrie. So Nancy reported her missing. And the police, they were, they were polite, but she could tell they didn't really take it seriously. Um, and she pointed out to them that, Carrie had excellent um, grammar and was meticulous with punctuation. And these texts that were coming in now were um, were just big messes and misspelled words. And they weren't impressed by that, which is understandable that, you know, they didn't know Carrie. And most of the time when an adult disappears, they do so on their own. And so thousands and thousands of people are reported missing every year. And by the end of the year, most of them have been found, and they were never really lost. They'd just chosen to leave on their own. So uh, Nancy was really frustrated because they didn't seem to be taking it as seriously as she thought they would. But they did, to their credit, they did go, um, they did do a, a trace on the phone through the, the phone company and was, were able to trace the pings and they traced those to an Omaha neighborhood, which was actually kind of near um, Liz Goyer's house. And um, in addition to that, the, the person that was texting Nancy and claiming to be Carrie had sent Nancy a, a photo of a check. And the check was for $5,000, and the signature was Shanna Goyer. And the texter said, Mom, I, I sold my furniture. You need to let this person in the house to come take it. And Nancy said, I'm not going to do that, not unless, not unless you call me. And so Nancy showed the police the picture of, um, of the check. And so they saw the name, Shanna Golier, and they managed to contact her. And she said, oh, well, yes. You know, she broke into my garage and she vandalized, she stole some checks. And so they accepted the story that she told them. Um, they believed that Carrie had flipped out and that she was uh, behaving badly and, and that she was stalking both Shanna and Dave. They accepted that as the truth. Well, did, 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 does Carrie have a... Um a history of some of, of mental issues or did she seem unstable or did she drink or do drugs? No. She, well, so, she had, she had terrible anxiety. She had bad anxiety, but she was extremely kind. Um, she'd never, she'd never vandalized property. She didn't have a bad temper, but she got depressed and had anxiety. And one doctor had um, said he thought she might be bipolar. Um, but that was just one out of a few different doctors she saw. So she was on medication, but there's no proof that she actually was bipolar because you can't, there's no definitive physical test that you can take to prove that. It's just based on whatever symptoms that the patient tells the doctor. And even if she was bipolar, it wouldn't mean that her behavior would become outrageous. Um, sometimes it, it does. Uh, with by with people are bipolar, but um, Carrie had absolutely no pattern uh, of this kind of behavior in the past. Yeah, yeah. I was just wondering if 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 her mother had noticed, you know, if if, if she'd like done weird things, ran away for a week at a time, or you know, um, had other issues with people no. like that. So she was you know. a dedicated mother. She was extremely dedicated to her son, and she went to every single one of his school events. And also, and this was heartbreaking, her father was on his deathbed. He was dying of cancer. 
and she was close to her father. She wouldn't have abandoned him. And he had to be told because he wondered where she was. He had to be told that she was missing. It was a terrible time for their family. Oh, sounds like it. Um, uh, so, so how did they put it together? What was what was the break in this case? Well, the um, <laughs> the stalking continued for years, and the stalker sent out over twenty thousand texts and emails harassing people. Um, she harassed Dave and every female he dated. Um, he, Carrie's family. She harassed the family. She um, set up a new Facebook page for Carrie um, as an imposter and tricked a lot of Carrie's friends into believing that it was Carrie's Facebook page. And it went on and on. And this stalker was sadistic because the, Carrie's mother was absolutely devastated, wondering what had become of her daughter and she knew, she just knew this person that was reaching out to her, saying she was Carrie, couldn't possibly be Carrie. And this doctor played games with her and actually had, um, I believe it was, it, it was this doctor using an app to make her voice sound like a male, um, called up Carrie's mother, claimed to be Dave Krupa, this was when Carrie was missing for months and said, hey, Carrie's in this a homeless shelter in Omaha. Uh, she, she wants you to come get her. And so Nancy got her brother to drive her there and the police met her there. And they went in. The, the police went in. They had Nancy wait in the car, came back out shaking their heads. They brought in a photo of Carrie. Carrie had never been there. And so this is a sadistic thing to do to a mother with a missing child. And it went on and on. And um, Did Carrie, it ever get violent? Like, um, were there, was there physical threats or anything like that? Yes, the, the threatening to, the stalker was threatening to um, slit people's throat, cut out their eyes, um, horrible things. And... and not just to females who dated Dave, but also threatening to kill the children of any female who dared even um, connect with Dave online and have a conversation with him. Wow. It was something that was bizarre. Well, you know, and, and with this, so now, now Dave feels that this Carrie is, um, you know, um, stalking him and sending him all these bad uh, messages and emails. But um, Carrie's mother seems to think otherwise, that it's, that it's not Carrie. So had, did, did they sort of a fight about that, like uh, Dave and, and her mother? or They never met. They didn't know each other. Remember now, Carrie had been dating Dave for two weeks. It was a new relationship. Okay. So they didn't, never spoke. Um, they had no idea what the other one was going through. So after... Oh. Go, go ahead. I was just going to say, wow, that's just... Uh, it's getting crazy here. <laughs> yeah. So after a couple of years of this, um, an amazing team of detectives asked for the case. They thought something wasn't right. Um, it was detectives uh, Ryan Avis and Jim Doty in Council Bluffs, Iowa, and they asked for the missing person case. And they, of course, had heard about all this vandalism and the stalking that was going on, uh, mostly in Omaha. And so Davis, um, or excuse me, Avis and Doty um, decided a unique, on a unique way of investigating it. One of them would investigate it as if Carrie were still alive, and the other one would investigate it as if she died. Oh. So okay. they the the one who was investigating it to see if she was alive very quickly concluded she couldn't be. Um her she she hadn't taken any money out of her bank, she'd abandoned her home. Um nobody had heard her voice or seen her. Only text. That's the only kind of communication um that 
they got from her. And they figured out pretty quickly this this lady is no longer alive and that someone had probably killed her. And they went to her mother, who um, went to her house. And when Nancy opened the door, she, she said she wasn't very friendly at first. She just was so sure that someone else was going to tell her that her daughter was a stalker and a vandal. Uh, and then the detective said, we think something's wrong. We think that something's happened to Carrie. And she was so relieved she hugged him. Finally, somebody was on her side. Mm. And so they started a very intense investigation. And um, Anthony Cava was a, a, a brilliant investigator uh, who does digital forensics. And he had a lot of emails and texts to un un untangle. 20,000 that had um, been sent by the stalker. And so his job was to trace those back to the source. And it wasn't easy because a number of um, email addresses, fake email addresses, had been set up. So he had to he had to take an email address that maybe took five minutes to set up and spend hours tracing it to the source. But he did it, and all three of them worked hours and hours and hours without pay because there just weren't enough hours in a work week to solve the crime. They all needed to make these huge sacrifices. And it, I think it's very unusual because these guys were really dedicated and they really cared. Hmm. Yeah, it, it, they, they would have had to have to, to dedicate all that time and effort. Um, so did they actually find... Um, so they, when they did this, they actually, when they did, they actually figure out who it was, or did they, at the beginning, or was it just a series of of addresses, or how how, how complicated was was it that um, it was set up? Well, uh, Shanna Golier was on their radar pretty quickly because her name kept popping up. For one thing, there was that check um, that this doctor had sent to Nancy Rainey that was signed by Shanna Golier, the check for $5,000 to purchase Carrie's furniture. And um, I believe it was Detective Doty. And he thought, why don't we compare this to Shanna's signature? Because Shanna said that Carrie had stolen the check. So he found an old draft ticket that she'd signed, and it was the same signature. So now they knew that Shanna actually wrote that check. The one that the stalker claimed that um, that Carrie had accepted from Shannon to sell her furniture, and they poured over the contents of her phone because she had actually brought her phone, given her phone to the police to download. She'd er she'd erased everything that was incriminating, so she thought, um, and so that they could help her catch the stalker that was terrorizing her and Dave. She didn't realize that she had a um, brilliant Anthony Cava um, looking into this now. And so he was able to find deleted photos, deleted texts, uh, all kinds of incriminating stuff. Carrie's car had vanished uh, with her um, and didn't turn up for a few weeks. And when it finally showed up, it was January, and it was showed up in Dave's, the parking lot of his apartment complex. Well, they found on Shanna's phone a picture of that car on Christmas Eve, weeks before. When the car was supposed to be missing, Shanna had managed to get a picture of it. So that was incriminating. But this was all circumstantial evidence. They needed something solid uh, to make an arrest. Yeah, I can't. I mean, I'm 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 listening to what you're saying, and holy smokes, is your book ever aptly named? What a tangled yeah, web! It was a tangled web for sure. So, what was that piece of evidence that that they finally grabbed onto? Well, they they managed to pile up a lot of circumstantial evidence, quite a bit of it. And when you when you have enough circumstantial evidence, you can get a, uh, an arrest and a conviction, but it's a lot harder. But the, um, the 
final, I think the very most, single most important evidence in this whole thing, they didn't discover until until Shanna was arrested and awaiting trial. Uh, Shanna's um, defense attorney, um, James Martin Davis, an award-winning defense attorney in Omaha, was representing her, and he thought it was going to be pretty easy to defend her because no body had ever been found. And there had, they did find blood uh, in Carrie's car, and that was a, that's a long, complex story, too. But um, they did have that, but it still didn't prove that Shanna had done anything to her. Although, um, Shanna had decided to put the blame on Dave Krupa's ex, Amy Flora. Um, and so Shanna stopped impersonating Carrie and started impersonating Amy Flora in emails and turned those over to the police. And the Amy Flora emails, which were not written by Amy Flora, um, who's a very kind-hearted, gentle person, but these emails that were supposedly written by Amy um, confessed. These emails were Amy confessing uh, to murdering Carrie and describing some things that the detectives realized had some truth in them. They knew that Amy Flora didn't write these confessions, but they figured some things were true. And one of those things was a claim that Carrie had been murdered in her Ford Explorer. And when the detectives saw that, they they processed the car again. It had been sold a couple times, but they got a hold of it, and they managed to find blood in the passenger seat um, that had been missed before because nobody had been looking for it. So they had the, they had these confession letters that they knew Amy had not written. um, And they were able to trace those to Shanna's residence. So they knew Shanna had written these confessions in Amy's name and that the confessions had a ring of truth to them. So they had that. And they had um, a whole big pile of other circumstantial evidence. And they had enough to arrest her. And that, But James Martin Davis, her attorney, um, did something really smart. He set the trial for, I believe it was three to four months after her arrest. And normally, a tra- trials are set at least a year in advance, sometimes two years. And so the prosecution normally has a lot of time to prepare. But, of course, people have a right to a speedy trial in this country. So his thinking um, was that if they did this quickly, there wouldn't be time to find a body. And without a body, it would be um, difficult uh, for um, them to get a conviction on Shanna. So the uh, the prosecution team and the detectives... um, and also, there's a detective in Omaha, Detective Dave, Dave Schneider, who joined forces with the Iowa team because they did discover that the murder occurred, or they believed it occurred in Douglas County um, in Omaha. So they needed a detective from Omaha to team up with them because these guys, these guys were in Iowa. The two mm-hmm. separate jurisdictions um, made this whole thing much more complex. So we've got this um, team of detectives and two dedicated pros- prosecutors, Brenda Beadle and Jim Masteller, uh, working endlessly on this case, um, wanting a conviction so badly so they could get justice for Carrie and her family. Um, but everybody was a little, little bit nervous because it, though it was very obvious to them that Shanna was the killer, they weren't sure um, if if it would be enough to convict. Now, um, James Martin Davis, who nickname is JMD, also advised Shanna to not go with a jury trial, but to go with a, a bench trial. So they had just a judge uh, who would be deciding the case. 
And he made that decision because of some of the horrendous things Shanna had done, including um, antagonizing the victim's family, um, tormenting them. So he knew that a a jury would not think kindly of her. But he knew that the judge would have to look at facts and would not be influenced by emotion like a jury can be. So it it would look like maybe it was going to be a toss up. Like nobody really knew if she was going to be convicted or not. And then shortly before they were coming up on the trial and Anthony Cava went to see Dave Krupa, who by now, of course, had been informed that um, Carrie was not the stalker. And asked him if he had any electronic equipment, anything that he, um, maybe they, they, he, they hadn't turned over before. And he said, you know, I think I've got a tablet in storage. And they said, well, can you get that for us? And he said, sure, I'll go dig around in there. And so he came back with this tablet and he gave it to Anthony Cava. And Anthony Cava pulled out the little disc. And started uh, looking at some things on it that had been deleted. And he quickly realized that this this little disc had at one time been in Shanna's phone. And she had erased everything on it and recycled it in the tablet that Dave had in storage. When she was playing <laughs> games on it. So Anthony knew he had something. And he started pouring over thousands of photos. And there were pictures of her posing selfies in the nude and pictures of her kids. And then he came across something kind of creepy. And he got a real bad feeling about it. Hmm. And he thought he knew what it was. But he checked with a forensic pathologist to be sure. It was a tattoo. It was a picture of a tattoo. But it looked weird. And as it turned out, it was Carrie's tattoo, and it was on her foot, but the foot was in a state of decay. Oh, wow. So the killer had taken us some souvenirs. She'd taken photos. There were also pictures of tarps that looked like they were covering a burned body. Um, there were pictures of her other tattoos. That was the most powerful piece of evidence. And it's kind of heart-wrenching because the tattoo was the Chinese symbol for mother. And Mm. tattoos on feet are really painful. And and some artists won't even do them on feet because of the risk of infection is high. But Carrie wanted that. The motherhood was so important to her. She loved her son so much. And she loved her mother. And it was just really special to her. So she endured hours of pain to get this tattoo on her foot. And as it turned out, that turned out to be a very loving gesture because it was the one thing that helped bring her mother and son peace because it helped them get a resolution. Hmm. So so what do you think she did with the body? And, and how long did she have it? Oh, gosh. Um, there's been a lot of speculation about this. And it, she's never been found. Hmm. But they think that she took her, she, they burned her and then disposed of it in the dump. They don't have, they don't have proof of that. But they found, Anthony Kava found a lot of um, references in the stalker's um, messages referring to Carrie as, um, as garbage and and referencing the dump and that kind of made sense to them um so they they think that she actually burned her she had to burn her at her home um possibly in a burn barrel in the backyard um but we don't know to what extent we don't know if what kind of shape she was in when she discarded her so the family does not have carrie's body But thank God, Nancy Rainey believes with all her heart that Carrie's spirit is okay. That she's, she's in, you know, she's survived in the afterlife and the body isn't important. 
course, you know, they would like to have that closure, but um, because they have that belief, because Nancy believes that, it does help her have some peace. Right, right. So I guess, uh, did she get convicted and put away for life or whatever happened? She's, yep, she's in uh, York, Nebraska, and she is in prison for life. And she still thinks she's getting out. She's still um, making plans. (laughs) Well, with the justice system, anything is possible, boy. You you know, (laughs) it really is. But with, with this book... Yeah. You know, we barely, I know we didn't have a lot of time, so we barely touched on some of the sadistic things she did. Um, but it goes on and on, and it's going to infuriate people. Um, so I don't, as long as this book is out there, I don't think there's any chance of her ever getting out because the public outcry would be so, would be huge. Well, what angle is she, is, does she actually uh, think she has an appeal of the case, or is it just being a good behavior and probation parole or what, what is it well she did appeal and it was denied and at that time she blamed her attorney on um, the award-winning attorney jmd in omaha <laughs> yeah. and you know said he did things wrong um he should have let her have a jury trial which of course you know he was smart because a jury would never have forgiven the things she did um which we didn't really go into, but they're pretty horrific. And so he did make the, the right move there. And, of course, her appeal was denied. Um, but she, I actually got a letter from her not too long ago, and she sent it in January, but it didn't get to me until like two weeks ago. And I had written to her early on and said I was writing a book, and I wasn't going to pretend to be her friend because I, I like to be honest. I just said, I was writing this book and asked if she had anything to say. That time she wrote back a very polite letter saying, well, I'm trying to prove my innocence and, you know, it wouldn't be good for me to have a book out there. So this letter I got a couple weeks ago that she sent, actually long after the book was done, was six and a half pages of all the reasons why she couldn't possibly be guilty and which none of it made much sense. But um, she said she was trying to prove her innocence so she could get out of there. Wow, crazy! Um, now, did did the boyfriend, did Dave, was he was he totally shocked by this? Like, did, was it a just far yes, out? it was, yeah. and he had such a hard time getting his mind around it because he had believed for years that Carrie, this woman that he thought was absolutely wonderful, and he actually there was actually a chance that they could have had a future together because they really clicked. But he had come to despise her because he believed that she was doing these things that um, that Shanna wanted him to think. And when you're in a certain mindset um, and you have you subscribe to a set of beliefs for a long period of time, it's really hard to see reality. It's kind of like what happens to people when they're in cults. Um, they keep getting information that is reaffirming their initial belief. And Shanna had worked on him uh, for years, uh, making sure that he would believe that it was Carrie stalking them. So it, it, he, I asked him what it was like when he finally realized, because when the police finally sat him down and told him what was what, and he said it was like walking through a dark forest, not being able to see anything, and all of a sudden, the sun comes out, and suddenly he could see everything clearly. Yeah, yeah, I could, I could imagine how hard it would be for him now. Um, he has such guilt. He feel he feels terrible. It just, you know, it, he just, it, he can't hardly even think about it too much because it's too painful, and he blames himself. But um, Nancy Rainey, Carrie's mother, very kind hearted woman. And she told me, and I relayed that today, that she does not blame him at all. She thinks he's a victim, too, and that he was in the wrong place at the wrong time, just like Carrie was. You know, it could happen to any of us. It's like people want to be smug, and they say, oh, well, if that were... If I, that happened to me, I would know, and, and you know, I would never be so dumb, and I wouldn't think this or that. 
But it's really easy when you know the outcome of a case to say you would know if you were if it had happened to you when you're in the middle of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's easy to look back or to look at people and say, yeah, well, they were dumb or something, right? But every one of us, we can we're all susceptible to these sadistic sociopaths that are all around us. Most of them aren't killers, um, but. They'll do things to harm us, steal from us, or my mom always said, she said, well, they'll take your, um, they'll take your job, they'll take your boyfriend, um, they don't care about you, but most of them are not going to kill. And so we've all known people like that, that pretend to be our friends, but really they want what we have. Um, you know, they sabotage you at work, or, you know, flirt with your boyfriend, or, you know, seduce their best friend's husband. Um, but most of them would never kill. But there are some that do. Wow. So what do you want people to get out of the book? When they read it, um, what do you hope they walk away with? Um, several things. One thing, I really want people to become more aware of all the way they can be tricked with electronics. I want them to learn about all the little ruses that scammers use online and through cell phones um, that can um, lure them into dangerous places. Um, sometimes the only problem would be that they that somebody wants their money. In rare cases, the person is planning to, to physically harm them. So I want people to educate themselves about that. And I also want people to pay attention to their gut feeling. Because I think every one of us has had a time when we had that feeling in our gut something wasn't right, but we ignored it. Yeah. And then we realized we should have listened to it. Yeah, when your spidey sense is tingling, pay attention. Yeah, your spidey sense, <laughs> yep. And we have that. It's a natural instinct. And we're shamed into like turning it off. And if you meet if you meet a dangerous female, especially if you're a male and you and you feel fear about her, like if she's not, she just something, a gut feeling you have, you think, oh, I'm, you know, I'm a guy, I shouldn't be scared of this woman. Well, maybe you should be. If you're feeling that, stop and think about it. Um, I think that females in particular, or the female victims, um, often don't listen to their own gut instinct. So I, both males and females, to listen to their gut and if you're wrong and you show that you're afraid, you know, it's better to be a little bit embarrassed if you make a mistake than to have your life taken because you were too embarrassed to show your fear. Yeah, exactly. So, so listen to your gut. Um, learn about electronic ruses. Um, and also, all of us need to realize that females can be just as dangerous as males. Yeah, even more. <laughs> Even more because we don't we don't see it coming. We're not expecting it. Mm. Now, now for the listeners, do you have a website or a place that you um, set up for people to follow you or uh, find out more information about your books? Yeah, they can. My website is www.authorlesliruel. dot com, but um, they can friend me on Facebook if they want. Um, I'm pretty active there and. Uh, there are actually a number of uh, true crime authors um, that I interact with that some of your listeners might be interested in reading their books, too. So I've still got room for more Facebook friends. Well, fantastic. Even after this tangled web <laughs> of uh, electronics, uh, you're willing to take Facebook friends. Well, keep wanting to be <laughs> approachable to your readers. It's like what we're... Um, Writers depend on our readers. Well, that's true. That's true. Wow. Fantastic. What a, what a great book and um, a great interview. And uh, now we'll have your book uh, up on our website as well, so people listening can just do one click and pick up the book. Well, thank you. Uh, well, it's been our pleasure. And uh, now the book is called A Tangled Web, and it's a cyber stalker, a deadly obsession, and the twisting path of justice. And the author, Leslie Rule, has been our guest. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Great stuff, Leslie. 
You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.